Hello, a very good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Charles. I'm the Managing Director of Communications at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, for many years, I was a BBC uh, foreign correspondent and presenter, and I'll be moderating our session this afternoon. Uh, I've been to many physical uh, IGFs, Internet Governance Forums. Uh, today, of course, we are meeting virtually. This will be the opening session of the 15th Annual Internet Governance Forum. It's a great pleasure to be with you over the next 90 minutes or so. We have a fantastic group of panelists. We'll be hearing from them about uh, the big issues uh, that really focus uh, on the internet today. And of course, we are speaking to you primarily, and in many cases from our homes, not from offices. And this issue of the internet governance has never been more important during the COVID age. I'm actually speaking to you from London, uh, from my home, where we are, of course, in lockdown, uh, and that is why the internet has become ever more important. 
We'll have our panel uh, in a few minutes' time, but we're going to start with some opening speeches. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Liu Xiaomin, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs at the UN, to take the stage. Liu Xiaomin, can you hear me? Xiaomin Liu, can you hear me? Uh, Under Secretary General, can you hear us? I'm sorry. Under Secretary I'm... General, are you there? Uh, some technical difficulties. We'll just try and get them online. Just give us about 30 seconds or so. Thanks. Okay. Jonathan, I'm connecting. Jonathan, you're muted. Yes. Under Secretary General, can you hear us? Yes, I'm now. Excellent. It is over to you for you to uh, start our speeches before we come to the panel. Thank you, Jonathan, for that introduction. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all friends and colleagues from the world. On behalf of the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, I welcome you to this opening of the 15th Internet Governance Forum and the High Level Leaders Dialogue. Due to a scheduled conflict, the Secretary General is not able to join us at this opening session, but we will have the honor of his address at the closing session next Tuesday. And due to COVID-19, this year's Internet Governance Forum is being convened online under the motto virtually together. This virtual IGF is being hosted by the United Nations with the support of the UN family. We have thousands of participants registered online, all around the world, in various channels. For today's opening session, first, I have the honor to invite His Excellency Ambassador Volkan Boska, President of the United Nations General Assembly, to address IGF. His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests. Thank you for the opportunity to address the 15th annual meeting of the Internet Governance Forum, IGF. I would like to thank the Secretary General for convening this important and topical discussion. Late
His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests. Thank you for the opportunity to address the 15th annual meeting of the Internet Governance Forum, IGF. I would like to thank the Secretary General for convening this important and topical discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to be direct. The SDG target of achieving universal connectivity by 2020 has not been met. In fact, 3.6 billion people continue to lack access to the internet. Only 19% of people in least developed countries have access to internet, in stark contrast to the 87% in developed countries. And the digital divide is exacerbating existing inequalities. In two out of every three countries, more men use the internet than women. All of this, of course, is only complicated and compounded by COVID-19, which has underscored the depth and gravity of this divide, and which is eroding development gains in countries and communities that are disconnected from the rest of the world. Deprived from an important means of development and adaptation to this pandemic, these countries and communities are at risk of losing an entire generation's worth of hard world development gains. While it can be argued that the decade of action and delivery has been derailed by the pandemic, quite the opposite can in fact be true. We can use this moment and opportunity afforded by COVID recovery efforts to fast track progress globally, to invest in a sustainable recovery that is guided by the SDGs. Addressing the digital divide is a significant part of this. As an SDG accelerator, improved digital access will have dividends across the whole of the SDGs, expanding access to education and employment and boosting progress in the areas of good governance and gender equality. Likewise, increased connectivity has the potential to boost economic growth and create new markets in fintech or mobile banking, amongst others. Another SDG accelerator, and one that is directly linked to the increased connectivity, is the need to address unequal access to reliable and renewable energy. With the UN High-Level Dialogue on Energy in September 2021, the Internet Governance Forum provides an opportune moment to explore the interlinkages between these issues and to chart a path forward. Ladies and gentlemen, as you go through your deliberations, I ask that you consider these issues and to ask yourselves this, what are the primary challenges impeding implementation at the multilateral, regional and local levels? And what kinds of partnerships on digital issues have been most effective? Before closing, allow me to say this. We cannot and should not be satisfied to live in a world where half of the population is more connected than at any time in history, while the other half is left unplugged and disconnected. I thank you for the opportunity to address the forum, and I wish you the best in your deliberations. Thank you very much. I thank the President of the General Assembly for his opening remarks and for his strong support to the IGF. Now, I have the honor to invite His Excellency, the President of the ICASOC, President of the Economic Social Council, the ICASOC, His Excellency, Ambassador Mooney Akrim, to address the IGF. Ambassador, you have to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Under Secretary General. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak uh, to this uh, uh, 2020 meeting of the Intergovernmental Forum. Uh, the fact that this virtual 15th session uh, of the forum hosted by the United Nations is being held virtually 
is one indication of the power of digital technologies to bring people together in search for solutions to sustainable development in these most difficult times. Digital technologies have made unprecedented progress possible. Yet, this progress has been unequal. Digital governance is critical. The latest research shows the high levels of concentration of resources, skills, and capacities needed to leverage digital transformation. And this research indicates the risk that further digitalization and data-driven development will lead to widening digital divides and income inequalities. We need stronger efforts so that national and international digital governance keeps up with accelerating technological change. Gaps in digital governance could quickly become bottlenecks for the application of frontier technologies for sustainable development. This is particularly visible if you see the mega trends in this sphere. One, the explosive growth of data volumes and cross-border flows. Second, the dominance of the ICT business environment by huge data management corporations. Three, the past pace and unprecedented change and unpredictable change in digital technologies. And four, the ever stronger force with which digitalization drives and sets the course of economic, social, and cultural change. The private sector, which owns 70% of the ICT infrastructure, has an important responsibility. It is essential to address some of the policies and issues relating to the big technology companies including tax policies, transfer pricing, free and fair trade, cyber security, and cyber crimes, as well as the propagation of violence and hate over the internet. Ensuring privacy, security, and responsible management of data is also fundamental. Some other areas where truly inclusive international governance processes could bring significant benefits include financial inclusion and online health services. But a long-standing challenge that should remain a critical focus for digital governance is the fight against the digital divides. As the president of the assembly has mentioned, 87% of individuals in developed countries are connected. Only 19% are so connected in the least developed countries. The COVID-19 crisis highlights the profound inequity of the digital divide, where half the world is using the internet to stay connected and continue business, while the other half is living literally in another world, disconnected and unempowered. This is why I believe that we, the developing countries, 
must aim not only to catch up, but to leapfrog into the digital era, focusing on broadband, 5G, artificial intelligence, and getting on board the knowledge economy. We should strive to ensure that the IGF continuously improves the space for developing countries to be heard and to be at the table in evolving digital governance. Credible and effective digital governance cannot exist without truly inclusive and participatory approaches. The participation of actors from developing countries is essential and must be better supported. The Economic and Social Council's Commission on Science and Technology for Development offers one indispensable space for inclusive consideration of digital governance issues. So does the SDI Forum, which will be convened next year again to consider digital and other technological advances. Ladies and gentlemen, the development challenges of digitalization require a coordinated multilateral response that draws on the respective comparative advantages of each actor in the international arena. The UN Secretary General's roadmap offers a good pathway to bridge the digital divide. I wish you all success in your consideration of this critical issue for the world today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, Ambassador Akrim. We are going to report to ACASOC the outcomes of this year's IGF discussion. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Ambassador. Excellencies, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to share some brief points about this year's IGF before we move to the high level leaders dialogue. The 2020 IGF is convened against the backdrop of COVID-19 under the theme, Internet for Human Resilience and Solidarity. Well, digital technologies were available Prior to the onset of the pandemic, the devastating impact of COVID-19 has laid bare the importance of internet-based technologies for our livelihoods. Indeed, we have seen significant digital transformation over the past months, and this digital acceleration is likely to continue. Last year in Berlin, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, together with the Chancellor Merkel, called on us to build the IGF into a platform where all stakeholders can come together to share policy expertise, debate, debate emerging technology issues, agree on some basic common principles, and take these ideas back to the appropriate norm setting forum. This year, in the virtual world, I'm happy to see that we are continuing to work together in transforming the IGF into the vision the Secretary General laid out in Berlin. This year's program includes more than 200 sessions that focus on four main thematic tracks, data, environment, inclusion, and trust. In the high-level leaders track following this opening session, discussions will be centered around internet governance in the age of uncertainty. Tomorrow's parliamentary roundtable will be on building trust in the age of a COVID-19 response and how the international community can recover better. Last week, as a part of the pre-event programs, the IGF 2020 Global Youth Summit was successfully organized. The IGF is providing a platform for youth to have their say in shaping the global internet policy 
as the leaders of future generations. As we continue with our dialogue, I encourage all participants to keep in mind four issues. First, let us not lose sight of the digital device. In the least developed countries, only 19% individuals were online in 2020, in 2019. We are leaving a large majority behind. We need solutions that help bridge the digital divides so that the benefits of the digital technologies can reach those being left behind unconnected. Second, let us eliminate the gender digital divide. In all regions of the world, especially in LDC countries, more men than women are using the internet. Eliminating this divide should be mainstreamed into women's empowerment initiatives. Third, let us make sure that the internet is economically within reach for all. Affordable access is still a big challenge for many. Even for these virtual IGF, there are participants who want to join but are struggling to get connected. Fourth, it is time to invest more in digital literacy and capacity development. More people struggle to connect due to lack of digital skills, and some are missing relevant content in their local languages. I'm aware that the IGF community has been working together to find solutions to these problems. Let me assure you that your own family will intensify our efforts to make the positive impact in this endeavor. And in the United Nations Department of Economic Social Affairs, the UN DESA, remains fully committed to digital co cooperation, and most importantly, to work with IGF stakeholder in groups to continue strengthening IGF. I wish you a productive meeting and a successful session. I thank you. Now let me give the floor back to our moderator, Jonathan. Mr. Liu, thank you very much indeed, Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, and apologies for all the uh, technical problems that we had at the beginning there, uh, not just uh, with Mr. Liu's Wi-Fi, my own as well. There is something ironic, I suppose, about talking about connectivity, uh, but it does show, you know, there are many challenges left, of course, uh, to be faced in terms of having the internet in a way that is accessible for everybody in many, many different ways. And we are now starting our high-level discussion uh, let me introduce our, our panel. We have with us Doris Luthard, the former president of Switzerland, chair of the Swiss Digital Initiative Foundation. Uh, Thomas Jotzenbeck, the commissioner for digital uh, affairs and also startups in the German Bundesrat. Ayaz Said Hayoum, the minister for economy, civil service and communications from Fiji. Hulin Jiao, the international telecommunications union secretary general. Chat Garcia Ramilo, the Executive Director, Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, Director, Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Victoria Grand, the Global Policy and Communications Head at WhatsApp. Pamela Cretu, uh, the Youth Representative from Moldova. And Monsignor Paul Tai, uh, who is President of the Center for Digital Culture at the Holy See, joining us from the Vatican. Uh, welcome to all of you. We're going to be discussing this issue of how to improve internet governance and of course it comes at a critical time when the internet has never been more important with all of us working more digitally in the current covid crisis so what needs to be done i'd like to start by asking you all a very simple question which is in which areas of people's lives do you see the biggest impact of digital transformation and sustainable development doris Lutard, perhaps i could ask you first of all Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, uh, I think uh, every part of our lives will be changed by digital technologies. But I think the biggest issue we will see 
in communication. Well, the proof is our conference, which is virtual, which was not in the past a reality. So communication uh, from companies, within companies, from governments, between organizations. So all this will change a lot our societal behavior and our, our way of communication and also learn together. We can come together very easily from all uh, over the planet. So that's, I think, a big change, but also a big chance. Second for me is finances. Uh, I think cash is, uh, uh, is an old fashioned uh, element. We have today also due to COVID, a lot of people using uh, credit cards, uh, using their mobile phone, especially also in developing countries. We see a lot of change. Many people did not have a bank account before in the classical financial sectors. Today, with uh, a lot of uh, possibilities, we see uh, small businesses evolving. We see a lot of people now can transfer money, uh, can uh, handle uh, uh, their bills, uh, whatever it means. So this is very important also for global trade and for global economy. And uh, third, I think, well, the word is today a shopping center. E-commerce evolved very uh, large. And I think also here, we see a lot of opportunities for developing countries when they have access to these tech technologies, but this might change uh, a lot of uh, uh, well, uh, 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 businesses we uh, are used in the past. And for this, we need very well educated people that uh, they know the technologies and also in my age, my generation, we must also here invest in education that we don't have a new gap of digital divide between young people who are used to uh, use their, um, all these applications and our generation. Actually in our roadmap, uh, we've uh, presented to the Secretary General last year, the high level panel of digital cooperation, we mentioned a lot of this transformation, how we can build a more inclusive world and uh, what should be done. So actually, I'm very happy that the Secretary General uh, presented uh, uh, this autumn, the roadmap, uh, how we can strengthen and develop the ecosystem of digital cooperation and governance in the spirit of IGF plus and in the spirit of the SDGs. So perhaps you can later on go in more details. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Doris Lothar, for kicking us off there. Let me come now to uh, Thomas Jatzenbeck from the German Parliament, uh, Commissioner for Digital Economy. Uh, wh where do you think the answer to this question lies about where we might see the biggest impact of digital transformation and sustainable development? So at first, let me say thank you for the opportunity to talk here and uh, also to stress out that we are very uh, thankfully for the opportunity last year to organizing the IGF here in Berlin and all of our team has good impressions about the last year and I hope it was uh, a, a good opportunity for the whole ecosystem to have a dialogue and we truly believe that IGF has a very important role and we truly believe in the multi-stakeholder approach uh, that uh, the IGF also stands for and the German government will even in the year after organizing the IGF will foster all these initiatives and we believe it's very important to have a worldwide free and open internet. And uh, so this is uh, what I believe uh, is the most relevant uh, take out of COVID-19, because we have seen that COVID-19 is a booster for digitalization. And especially for the more major uh, uh, economies in the world like ours and all the European uh, economies are, uh, we can see that uh, we have always a huge debate about the challenges and the opportunities of the internet. And I think we should look more on the opportunities and not only on the challenges. And before COVID-19, we had a big dispute about is everybody included in all these technologies and does every, is everybody capable of using that? And uh, what about privacy and so on and so on and so on. And we learned overnight with COVID-19 that things um, are possible that seemed unimaginable before. 
And uh, despite of all the downsides of COVID-19 to all the people that are harmed about that, to all the businesses also that are harmed about uh, 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 through COVID-19, uh, I believe uh, uh, there are also big opportunities and digitalization is one of them. And as I already said, so we believe in a free and an open internet. And I believe this is also a big contributor for more sustainability, the opportunity to talk freely and open together. And we are concerned about some of these developments about a more fragmented internet. We believe that an open internet is key. And therefore, we will bring in ourselves in all uh, uh, in, in the whole way of, of enabling more opportunities here also in this format of this uh, IGF, we have uh, organized a digital strategy in the German government digitalization needs values. Uh, so this is important for us and no matter whether it's a question of competition or market access of handling personal data freedom of opinion or any other field, we need the best possible policy environment for our online lives and as a community of nations companies civil society technical experts and science the igf is the right forum at which to discuss this in detail as a co-champion in the consultation process of the future architecture of the igf we have presented an options paper it's important for us and our aim is to stimulate and structure the debate for an evolution of the multi-stakeholder models towards an igf plus I am looking forward to an inspiring discussion and thank you for the opportunity again to speak here today. Thank you very much. Let, let me ask you just one question though before you go. You talked there about uh, transformation and I just wonder how much of a leap forward you thought we'd made during this crisis, this COVID crisis. Do people talk about a, a massive leap forward for the age of digital? Yes, we've, we've seen a, a big push here quite overnight, and I think this is, uh, this is a good development. And if you look at all these continents, I believe that Europe has more potential on digitalization as it's uh, realizing right now. And therefore, our government is trying to push that forward with this digital strategy. We also foster the startup ecosystem. We have an AI strategy. We are focusing on blockchain. We believe that quantum computing is a key where we are going to invest and so therefore I need, uh, there is a lot of innovation potential all over the world and Europe in special. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you for another question a bit later on. Uh, let's move now to Aya Saeed Khayoum, the Minister for Economy, Civil Service and Communications in Fiji. Let me ask you, uh, Minister, so where do you see from where you're sitting there in the Pacific, the biggest impact of digital transformation and sustainable development? Well, I, th I think on a couple of fronts, the, uh, the earlier speaker mentioned about, uh, you know, aspects such as digital money wallets. I think that made a lot of bank people to mainstream them, and in particular, bring them to uh, access services that they previously could not access. Uh, you have to also remember that, uh, you know, we are about 330 islands, 100, in, uh, 100 or 110 or odd so are so inhabited. So, you know, we getting connectivity to them and the cost of connectivity obviously can be quite expensive, given we do not necessarily have the economies of scale. So notwithstanding that, you know, we have been able to um, focus a lot of funding in those areas. So government services rolling it out to rural areas, your social welfare payments, um, you know, e-ticketing for uh, transportation, uh, the pensioners, uh, disabled persons, etc. With COVID 19, I mean, we've got now about 202 days uh, without any new community transmissions. You now, we've been very stringent from the beginning, but using the digital platforms to, for example, do contact EGF uh, now. And it was very, very important for us because, you know, we're a, a, much of our economy depends on tourism. And tourism is completely up. So, our revenue streams have come down significantly. Uh, and as a result of which we have to rely on technology to roll out the services, new unemployment fits. So people are becoming a lot more acutely aware about using those tools to be able to access services in that environment. Last but not least, of course, is climate change. Uh, we are the climate change. Goal 13 talks about, you know, uh, under the SDGs, our ability to deal with the issues of climate change. And so in terms of communications, in particular to the outer islands, early warning systems, 
that's critically important uh, for us. You, you mentioned there the high cost of uh, installing and making sure there is access for everybody around the many islands that you have. What, what help do you think could the international community give there? Well, I think you know, we, th there's a number of ways that we could do that. Uh, we have set up, for example... I um, Said Khaim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Maybe not. Let's move on. Uh, let me move on to uh, Hu Lin Zhao from uh, the International Telecommunications Union. Can you hear me? Yes, very good, Doris. Thank you. Yeah, dear friends, I'm very pleased to join you at this panel discussion. I think that uh, I, I, I really like uh, IGF. What I have heard so far, so everything I want to communicate, now you communicate to the public so that instead of uh, me, and I heard many, many same uh, messages from all of you, that is wonderful. Now I want to just remind us one thing. Today we consider everything is uh, granted like. Now without the ICT, another COVID-19, the society will become worse, very terrible. But with uh, you know, ICT, it seems to be that we can manage our life facing this COVID-19. But don't forget, this, this ICT services and applications are available to us thanks to 15 years or 20 years hard work of ICT workers and all of you. And IGF, together with uh, the WISIS forum, are two consequences of our WISIS process. And the World Summit Information Society, I too suggest the United Nations to organize in 2003 in Geneva, 2005 in Tunis. And we try to encourage people to, you know, to do the best to build up the information society. And people may not realize how important that should be. Now today, all of a sudden, COVID-19 forces us to to come to this society with ICT. So this is something I think that uh, it's really uh, important to remember that thanks to the hard work of everybody, we have this ICT infrastructure, we have this ICT application. But on, I, we, I also heard that, you know, for example, privacy, you know, for, for example, confidentiality and the security of our tools like uh, Zoom, like, uh, like a team, like uh, Interplify, whether this is safe or not, the people ask questions. Well, uh, tele-education, you know, telemedicine, all the system is safe or not? So that is quite, of course, today, you know, we first ask whether is this uh, possible for us to use or not. Then you ask the security, like the quality of the services. But all this is available to those who are connected. And we should not forget that it's, uh, as, a, as a chairman of uh, Exoc just made, the whole population not connected yet. And how can we bring these people to be connected? That is um, very big challenges. Uh, Secretary General Guterres called for everybody to be connected by 2030 with affordable prices. And this just like, imagine, how population not connected yet. We only have 10 years to go. So if we do the business like uh, before, you will never get it. So we have to do something somehow smart and innovative. I think that Doris, you help us with your high level digital panel to give us a lot of wonderful ideas. This is absolutely, uh, you know, uh, very, very strategically important to all of us. But I think that uh, to do the business, let me just give you a very simple example, that uh, for each country, you have uh, several telecom operators. And it's telecom operators who invest a lot of ICTs. And for you to get the children be, you know, comfortable during uh, this COVID-19 with uh, tele-education, you need to have very good infrastructure for broadband connection to the family. And you have to go to, for the education minister to go to all the telecom operator to have uh, arrangement. And for, you know, for the education like that, for health like that, everybody do the same thing. So that is my message to the G20, the financial minister meeting, the health minister meeting. I think that we have to change our mind. If we continue to do the business as before, you will never get the business done by 20 suit to connect everybody. So you have to change your mind to engage everybody to work uh, uh, with the common strategy to put ICT really at the, the focal point uh, to be a uh, supporter, to pillar to support our social economic development, not to leave this to each ministry to do their business 
with their own budget to use ICT to improve their own efficiency. But if we put everybody together, I think that will be, will be much efficient. So that was uh, my message to the G20 health minister, you know, financial minister, even foreign ministers. And then I think that uh, I put uh, four eyes as my priority you know, since 2015, when we celebrate uh, ITU's 150th anniversary. And Doris, you joined us for celebration. And I, I put the four eyes since, since that moment. Infrastructure is absolutely important infrastructure. We have to extend the current infrastructure to connect those who are not connected yet. We have to upgrade the current infrastructure with the high technology like 5G, AI, cloud computing, all this. So we need a good infrastructure. And then we need an investment. Investment is absolutely important. Now, according to some studies, we need an investment, for example, to improve connectability, broadband connectability of Africa by just a double the current penetration for one year. We need uh, at least $1 billion where to find the money. And uh, currently, the money is mainly coming from the private sector. So the public also needed to create a good environment to attract the investment and then to encourage investment and to create a good environment. And then we also need to have innovation. So innovation, you know, we have to get a smarter policy environment with the innovative ideas. So that the innovation is not only only for technologies, but also for this kind of policy environment. We need a good innovation. And of course, the last AI is inclusiveness. Inclusiveness, uh, I, I don't know that the way in April, I was in, uh, I'm in Geneva, when I heard from a Swiss on the television saying that uh, the senior people in the mountains don't know how to use uh, internet to order their goods. They are asked to stay at home, they cannot go out. But then, you know, that the local community try to bring the food, the vegetable to their door, but then they have to pay them. And these senior people don't have money because they used to go to the machine to get money, but they don't know how to use the internet to order the food code. So this is also, you know, some kind of things we only see that uh, under this COVID-19 situation. So COVID-19, we are asked us to do uh, a lot of things. I, I think that we have opportunity. And this uh, IGF meeting, I think that is absolutely uh, critical for us because that is, uh, uh, this is the platform we can invite everybody to come together to look at the challenges, to look at the ideas to move uh, forward. And this year marks the 15th anniversary of uh, IGF. Of course, it's 15 years of uh, which is a forum. So we'd like to, you know, to, to, to continue to use this platform to encourage more investment in ICT infrastructure innovation, and then to bring the benefit of ICT to everybody, not leave anybody behind. So, sorry to take so much time. Let me just stop here. And uh, last message I also like to, I know that in my panelist, I have one from uh, uh, Holy See. So I visited the, the Pope. The, the father told me, I visited him in his office uh, in September, 2017. So, he clearly you know, supported the ICT to facilitate the ICT uh, infrastructure development, to facilitate the social economic development. And he was so kind to give me a strong message. I delivered at the World Telecommunication Development Conference held in, in Argentina in September, uh, in, in, in October, that he support ICT. And he particularly paid attention to those disabled people, immigration. Uh, the people, you know, from suffer from this immigration, so, you know, these refugees. I, I think that uh, we are very pleased with uh, his message. We have to work uh, hard to mobilize every uh, possible resources to, you know, focus uh, on this ICT development. And uh, IGF is the right place. It's a very good uh, platform. Thank you very much. Ulin Zhao, thank you very much indeed. And uh, you were talking there about the need to invest in infrastructure. The issues that uh, London is having today, for example, where I am show that, you know, with so many people working at home in lockdown, clearly the infrastructure struggles to cope with that. And you're seeing that in the, the dropouts I'm having. I think it's uh, something many, many people have experienced in various indeed. cities. Uh, during this uh, particular crisis. Um, before I came to you, I was asking Ayi Saeed Kayum a, a question from Fiji, and I hope you're still there, Minister, in Fiji, which is about what you thought the international community might be able to do to help you in Fiji, bearing in mind 
that you have hundreds of islands to roll out infrastructure to? Most definitely. I mean, we've been, uh, for example, we've got a project with the World Bank where the World Bank has funded us uh, or our ability to be able to connect um, the second largest island. There's a number of areas where you have unconnected people, in particular, you know, sort of around coves in gullies up on, uh, on uh, various smaller islands. So we've got islands, but also there is a need to, for example, we do a bit of work with ITU in respect of frequencies and be able to roll out the planning frequencies. Um, but I, uh, on the other hand, we've had in terms of radio telecommunications, we've had the Japanese government that provided funding to roll out AM radio stations, which travels a lot better over, over water to get out to the, you know, the remote islands. So those types of collaboration actually can you know, take place. But I think it also falls within the ambit of, uh, of climate change, the building the capacity to get people to be connected, I think that's critically important. So there's a number of projects we've got that uh, different agencies can work de depending on the area of expertise. Thank you very much indeed. I'm glad uh, we heard that answer because it is important in terms of many, many emerging economies. Uh, let's uh, move on. And uh, Hulin I was just talking with you about uh, seeing the Pope. So let, let's go to the Vatican. Paul Tai, Monsignor Paul Tai in, uh, in the Vatican at the Holy See. How is this question seen from there? Well, I suppose the Vatican itself is one thing, but the Vatican as a center of communities of faith around the world like everybody else, we've been learning about digital transformations as places of worship have closed and as people have tried to keep their communities alive through the use of digital uh, means of communication and particularly masses and celebrations. And I suppose it's about learning about that, that it's not just about doing what you've always done, except you now put it online. And that's almost emblematic, I think, for all of us. I think the digital transformations, there's a technological side to it. We have to understand the technologies, but more importantly, I think our interest is at times of how what's happening with digital transformations are transforming societies, how we relate to each other, how we build community. I just take three issues maybe in particular. One is everybody has been speaking for a number of years about how important interdependence is. It came out very strongly in the high level panel reporting on digital cooperation to the Secretary General. But interdependence, I think we would want to say, not just as a statement of fact, COVID, in a sense, has reminded us how interdependent we all are, but wanting to make of interdependence a value. We see a value in the solidarity that exists between people. We go beyond just a mere tolerance of one another as people who share the same space, but rather have a sense of um, the importance of expressing what it means to be one human family one family that's sharing a common home and that has to work together to do that as best as possible. Maybe two issues in the digital transformation I think we've all seen that I would like to maybe raise questions about what is the transformation of work? Where suddenly everybody or not everybody, so many people are working from home. And I think that raises questions for us about where do we draw the lines between the separation of work and family or private life? I think within families there's been the very interesting um, question of how do we tease out the responsibilities for shared domestic responsibilities when both partners are working from home. And I think we need to reflect on some of these things. One that would worry me slightly is as more and more people work from home, we lose the sense of solidarity that should exist between co work. And is there a sense in which we all are being put onto something like platform working, something of big economy inadvertently? So as we look to the future with the reality of perhaps more and more work being displaced, I think we need to keep alive that sense of work as not just something that gives us financial reward, but work in its richest sense is a place where we express our dignity by our creativity, by our capacity to contribute to the well-being of society. And also, let's be honest, it's in a true work. And just draw a parallel with the area of education, where again, so much of education has moved on to online forum. I think the real issues there, this is where the domestic digital divides between the haves and the have-nots, those who have access to good computing, good Wi-Fi connectivity, are the differences there are being extenuated by what we're seeing in this field at the moment. 
Um, I think in particular we need to look at issues where children who have access and don't have access to education. And I think also schools as not just providers of education, but in many places that feed and care for and look after general needs of those students. All of those issues I think we need to be attending to. I suppose the final one we've always had a concern is as to whether platforms that should help us to become close to each other are sometimes spreading inequalities. And that I suppose is a general concern always within the OEC. Hello. Oh, I see the photograph there. Yes. <laughs> Is Jonathan online? The ap apologies, we are aware that uh, there's some connectivity issue. That's the same for some of the panelists this morning. Um, please, uh, we ask for patience for 30 seconds for our moderator to get back online. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul Tai. Uh, let's turn to uh, Chat Garcia Ramilo, the Executive Director of the Association for Progressive Communications. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think the one thing that we've seen in this pandemic is that we have very different contexts. However much we um, think that the equality, inequalities that have been discussed, you know, um, mentioned earlier, these are very different for everybody. And I think the acceleration of the digital transformation has exposed the very profound vulnerabilities of those who suffer most. And I think these are the, I think this is what we need to really pay attention to if we are to address inequalities in the digital age. So people and groups who have been historically discriminated against and excluded on the basis of race, class, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability is also an important um, thing that we need to look at. Um, so it's not only about which areas are impacted by digital transformation, but also about who are affected by them. I think digital technologies permeates most aspects of our lives now, but in significantly different ways because of this intersecting and multiple forms of systemic and, instru and structural inequality and injustice. And I want to emphasize that if we are to really look at um, addressing the divides and the inequalities that can be magnified, as was mentioned earlier by um, the president no, of the General Assembly. So, I mean, already um, the digital divide has been mentioned uh, a lot of the the ones who are still not connected are those who, li who live in least developed countries those rural women uh, women uh, people who live in rural areas and women um, the other area as we know i mean the internet has been really a space to express to associate to organize with others and to participate in public life this has been really um, empowering for many but with the, the power over digit, digitalization and therefore on our personal data and people's interactions have been much more and more concentrated in the hands of big tech. I mean, we've seen how much a lot of people have lost jobs in this pandemic, but we've also seen the massive, the massive um, profit of big tech. They're the ones who are then you know profiting so much for for people who are using platforms etc no? i mean that is a reality that we i think must look at if we are to address inequality and they also have then with this with this concentration they have a lot of power over deciding on content on what is on on expression on and and public space which is now more and more has become the online space. Um, and I think it is something to really look at if we are to really address injustice and inequality. I also would like to, to um, reinforce 
um, the environmental impact. There are many um, useful um, uses of ICT for uh, environment for environmental um, um, sustainability. But the pandemic has also propelled demand for digital technology services and platforms. And this exponential production and deployment, as well as waste of digital technology is a real challenge for us. And it can contribute to climate and environmental emergency. It will not, it, you know, that will, it will spare very few of us, but as we know, for example, in the Pacific, we've heard, no? they are really are the ones in, in more precarious situation situation. So I think, again, I just want to emphasize here that to avoid reinforcing and magnifying inequalities, we really should um, pay a lot of attention to um, ensure to and understanding how this impacts differently, and that this impacts then require specific responses. It cannot be it cannot be a general response. Digital transformation can is not necessarily all good. It needs um, to be thought about very carefully and it, it should include public policy interventions that promote meaningful access, yes, preserve free and open internet, as well as reinforce human rights as, and also mitigate climate crisis. Thank you very much indeed, Chuck Garcia Remila. Um, so how does all this play into development economics? Let me turn now to Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, Jeffrey, how do you see this playing out? Great, thank you so much. What a wonderful discussion. I, I think uh, everybody agrees that we are in the digital age. The technologies are really uh, extraordinarily effective potentially for healthcare, for education, for e-finance, commerce, e-governance, uh, and, and many other areas of the economy. Uh, digital is uh, utterly disruptive and it's uh, absolutely uh, accelerated, of course, uh, this year. Um, so we need to face up to uh, two basic challenges, uh, at least uh, two, two to start. One is uh, universal access. This is not so expensive, but it can't be dragged on for the next 10 or 20 years because we can't uh, actually expect any part of the economy to function without digital access now. And we can't affect people to be, uh, can't expect people to be effective citizens uh, if they are not online. They won't be receiving government services, transfers, information, uh, being able to register for many things. So we dramatically need to accelerate uh, access. Fortunately, this is the most scalable technology in human history, uh, so that if we put a timeline for uh, universal coverage uh, within the next uh, short number of years, we will achieve it. Now, the questions are how to finance it. Well, first, uh, thanks God we have Biden as a president-elect, because maybe we'll have U.S. cooperation for the first time in a number of years. I would put this uh, as a challenge to the United States. The U.S. is still the world's digital leader. Uh, it is still the controller of the most important platforms. These are monopoly platforms. Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Microsoft are the portals that are the most important worldwide. They are generating unbelievable amounts of uh, monopoly profits and wealth. And the United States has a responsibility that it, of course, did not meet under Trump. Trump was the opposite of meeting any international obligations. Now we have at least a chance. We'll see whether there is uh, some decency there. China is a wonderful uh, investor and supplier uh, in developing countries. I really want to encourage this by Huawei. Stop uh, letting uh, the United States, uh, you know, the Trump uh, attacks on China slow the access to what is the lowest cost, most effective 5G systems in the world. Uh, the U.S. was behind in this technology, so it tried to stop China from uh, developing uh, its partnerships, its monopoly, its uh, um, it, its uh, uh, 
investments, uh, its uh, diplomacy. I hope this will stop now because it was uh, errant nonsense, but we absolutely need to also have China as a major investor and sharer of digital technologies because China is actually ahead in social applications, I would say, of uh, any country. It's got the largest group of internet users. It's got very advanced uh, systems for hundreds of millions of people, and it can share these effectively in the Belt and Road Initiative and other uh, places as well. So my basic point is, let's set a timeline not to 2030. There are a few big players in the world, the telecom sector and big tech, that have the responsibility. It's in their interest, though we also have to tax these companies and regulate them more effectively. But we need to get to universality. Otherwise, we are really going to entrench not just an underclass, but a non-class. If you're not online, you're not going to exist uh, in this world uh, because you will not be able to function. And by the way, let me just close by saying that uh, the amount of wealth, uh, as Chat just said, that has gone to the top should allow us to focus on, on what we're really talking about. There are now 78 tech billionaires that have a combined net worth of $1.9 trillion. Just 78 people, 1.9 trillion. And this year, those 79 people have had capital gains of $612 billion. So when we say, where are we going to get the billion for Africa? This is $612 billion since January 1 for 78 people. So Mr. Bezos, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Gates, you've made fortunes this year, tens of billions of dollars. This morning, Mr. Bezos is worth $194 billion, 194 personally. And I'm holding here the investigation of competition in digital markets of the House Committee on the Judiciary of the US, which shows how monopolized this sector is and how Amazon has used its monopoly power ruthlessly. So this is not something where we ask, how can we get a billion dollars? There's trillions out there of just a few people. And we need to get smart and not just be taken over by 78 tech billionaires in the world, but actually run a society for everybody. And this technology is for everybody. So I'm not saying it's so easy. It's easier now than it was before November 3rd, but we're still facing real uh, grim truths of power and wealth. But we're also lucky inheritors of the most powerful scalable technology in human history. So if we want to get everyone covered in the next five years, no problem. Absolutely no problem. Indeed, what the telecoms heads tell me is it's not even infrastructure. It's just who's going to pay for their household services because the infrastructure already covers most of the world, but people aren't online because they can't afford devices and they can't afford the data costs. So if we solve a few financing problems, by telling these companies that is your social license. Sorry, you connect everybody. You, Jeffrey, are, a common, Jeff you are a common carrier. You must connect everybody, period. Then we can get it done. But uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, discussion and uh, everybody is completely oriented in the right way. Uh, this is our best chance. Let me just add one more point. Uh, which is that under any circumstances, a lot of jobs are going to be lost as well as gained by this, these technologies. These are so efficient, they will let machines do the work of human beings. There's no question all over the economy, we're going to lose jobs. So we're going to have to tax the profits from these companies to share with the whole society. Otherwise, we're really going to end up with 78 people who own the whole world which is not exactly what we want. Thanks.
Jeffrey Sachs, uh, thought-provoking and provocative as usual. I think this would be a very good moment then to hear from Victoria Grand or WhatsApp. Good morning, everybody. Many thanks to our organizers for working so hard to bring us together in these unprecedented times. Now, there is no more important policy conversation today than ensuring that the internet remains open, inclusive, secure, and responsive to the needs of our time. As others have noted, because of the coronavirus, today's IGF conversation is happening digitally, just like so many other important conversations that are happening around the world right now. And billions of people are turning to WhatsApp every day to have these important conversations, to talk with loved ones and friends, to work, to teach and to learn, to connect with their doctors, with therapists, to buy things from businesses during the pandemic to get what they need for their daily lives. A recent survey in Indonesia found that over 80% of consumers are using WhatsApp to shop or communicate with businesses during the pandemic to get what they need. And this is all happening for free. We're also working hard to build new tools, including the ability to make payments right in the app, uh, something that we've just launched in India and that we will soon bring to Brazil to meet this moment and to support businesses and consumers during this critical time, especially the large populations of unbanked people in so many of the countries that WhatsApp serves. Trusting that we can do all of these things and share the information that we share, the health information, the business information, the bank and credit card information, personal photos, this is all critical. Traditional approaches to internet governance have long been rooted in values like free expression, privacy, transparency, and the rights of individuals. These values are at the heart of WhatsApp. We believe in every person's right to have a truly private conversation. We are more open and more free to express ourselves when we know conversations aren't being recorded, collected, or monitored when what we say cannot be traced back to us. And as we live more and more of our lives online without question being accelerated by COVID, we should strive to match the security and the privacy we have when we connect in person and not accept that it will be weaker because it's happening digitally. That's why we use the best, most secure technology available end-to-end -end encryption to protect the privacy of the 100 billion conversations that happen on WhatsApp every single day. We are proud to put this powerful technology into the hands of more than 2 billion people, again, for free. We are also proud to see that platforms that offer end-to-end -end encryption are now outpacing those that don't. The vast majority of messages that are sent today are sent over end-to-end -end encryption, encrypted platforms. And even platforms like Zoom are now offering this technology given strong consumer demand that's arisen during COVID. Despite this, a number of proposals have been advanced recently, very concerning proposals in liberal democracies to roll back this vital protection at precisely the time when we need it most and make it something that you and I no longer have access to. We are seeing this in the UK, in the US, in Brazil, in Australia and the EU, as well as in India. We are committed to fighting for encryption. It is our best frontline defense for our personal security and our collective safety and security. It is among the greatest benefits we can bring to an open, safe and free and secure internet because the more we connect, the more there is to protect. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Victoria. And finally, in this round, let's hear from uh, Pamela Cretu, our youth representative from Moldova. Pamela. Uh, thank you very much. A warm, first of all, a warm hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. It's a great pleasure and honor. Um, so first of all, let me, let me share a few reflections. Digital transformation has had undoubtedly in the past decade, a significant impact on our lives. And I want to specifically touch on a few of them. Quality education, which is sustainable development goal number four, has seen a tremendous transformation with the emergence of technology from online tutorials, video lessons, eBooks, e-libraries, 
and distance learning. All these have, have opened up programs to young learners uh, from around the globe who would otherwise be excluded. Today, ICTs are used, to, are used by schools and other educational establishments both to develop ICT skills and provide innovative teaching of various such as mathematics or foreign languages. Well, here in Austria two years ago, I used interactive language learning applications to be able to navigate in my new country. Today, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone, regardless of nationality and level of education, and its consequences have hit the most vulnerable the hardest. Students from privileged backgrounds supported by their parents could find their way, their, their way with school's doors closed by adjusting to by rapidly adjusting to uh, distance and remote learning. Teachers and educators from privileged backgrounds, supported by their school's administrations, learned to adjust more rapidly to the new modus operandi. So those from disadvantaged backgrounds often remain shut out when their schools shut down. And it is both about the students and their teachers. So this COVID-19 crisis has highlighted and intensified the many inequities in the, educa in, in the education system around the globe, from access to the broadband and computers needed for, for online education and the supportive environments needed to focus on learning, up to the misalignment between resources and needs. Children, students, and parents have to rely more on their own resources to continue learning remotely through the internet. Teachers also have to adapt to the new pedagogical concepts and modes of delivery of teaching, for which they may not have all been trained, which is significantly affecting the quality of the education provided. However, learners in the most marginalized groups who don't have access to digital learning resources or lack the resilience and engagement to learn on their own are at risk of falling behind. So in moving forward, I believe that key stakeholders should be looking at solutions to maximize participation of everyone in the education process so that no one is left behind, including children and young people with special needs. And while we can acknowledge that not everyone could be provided with a laptop or computer during these difficult times, we have to ensure that communities bring together come together to identify local solutions such as community libraries, local radios, and community support groups. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Pamela. Um, let's uh, move on now to what is going to be a very quick fire round. We have about uh, 15, 20 minutes left. We've got uh, something else to do after this quick fire round as well, so we want to leave time for that. Um, I'd like to ask you all, so you might want to think about this in, in very, but to explain very shortly in about a minute maximum um, to each of you, just what is the one policy action that you would really like to see in order to help bridge uh, the divide, the digital divide in a post-COVID world? What would be the one most important thing you think needs to be done? Uh, Doris Lutar, perhaps I could uh, start with you. Well, I think uh, the analysis was, was quite similar. Infrastructure is key. So this means, uh, well, the idea of Jeffrey Sachs might be a little bit political and <laughs> provocative, but it's, he has right. There, there are uh, some people, some companies who earn a lot of money with our data. So this must uh, be discussed at the level of G20 because it's a very a political issue. We know that the OECD has some fiscal uh, uh, elements uh, which are discussed. Second, I think uh, um, Switzerland is also one of the countries, uh, major donors for aid for development. Here we need to change our instruments because we are still in the classical world, with a lot of classical instruments, so maybe it's better invest in a free Wi-Fi than in bridges and roads. Third, we need an IGF plus because infrastructure is one, but the governance needs to be adapted to the digital world. Multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary approach like we did today, and IGF must also 
uh, open, must be more open to other experts, to science and to the politicians. Uh, not a lot of ministers and uh, 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 government people participate at these meetings and governments don't like too much multi-stakeholder approaches. So mm. this is a game changer and there's a, a change of our minds. This is not easy for governments, but we made some recommendations and this is a key element that we can bring a lot of people in. The World Bank report said clearly uh, what the world could profit when a lot of people have access to the internet, uh, how fast we could really bring wealth uh, to the planet. So it's easily done when we have infrastructure, governance, some standards. Here ITU could make a good job that we have some standards uh, and uh, a lot of values, ethical values is important for this world. So far, trust and ethical values we have in the analog world, most of these values are also uh, valuable in the cyber world, but we must discuss it and perhaps also codify it, that we have some charter uh, that we can uh, uh, rely on and uh, which could also help us that ethics uh, is uh, uh, we can rely on. F fake news, like we've seen in the last days, is a good example how it should not work. And therefore, the Swiss Digital Initiative I preside here, we are working exactly in this field of ethics in the internet, and not only with analysis and new reports, but concrete projects. So for the moment, we are developing a digital trust label that uh, users can rely on a, on an application which is trustworthy. Doris Lutar, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned the ITU there, so let me go to Hu Lin Zhao. Uh, Hu Lin Zhao, one policy action that you think should be adopted? I think that uh, IGF talked a lot about the cyber security and the privacy, all these kind of things. So we have not made much progress, although we already put this on the table for many, many years. I think one problem is, uh, unfortunately, we do some business under the uh, geopolitical debate. And if we could uh, try to avoid the geopolitical debate, uh, but uh, do something, you know, put uh, the challenges, uh, problems on the table for, for good discussion, I, I think that we may be able to make some progress. That one. Another thing is uh, Jeffrey just uh, mentioned that. One side, we don't have money. We need a lot of money. On the other side, someone has a lot of money. And has saying, how can we, you know, make uh, our our society be really some kind of uh, healthy, positive to do the business. I think that we need a lot of uh, good uh, ideas. Thank you very much, Hu Lin Zhao. Uh, let me go to uh, Thomas Jartzenbeck at the uh, German Bundestag. One policy action, Thomas Jartzenbeck. Mm -hmm. So first, I'd like to say that not all governments are skeptical about the multi-stakeholder uh, approach. We believe in that, to make that clear here, as Doris said something different. So uh, our idea would be a, a, a non or an anti-fragmentation initiative. Was we believe in one net and one world and open and free speech. And so this would be our initiative. And part of this uh, uh, anti-fragmentation initiative would also be a strong antitrust initiative because I believe beside of all what the governments are doing it is really important to keep also the commercial internet open and that means that we need to fight against some of these monopolies and make the doors and windows open for new players and challenges. Thank you. Uh, I aside Hayum in Fiji, one policy action. Well well, I, I think uh, for us, it's critically important to get a level of connectivity. We've increased connectivity from 60% coverage to 95% in the last five years. We like to go to that last 5%. It's critically important. I also would love to be part of what Jeffrey Sex uh, mooted. Maybe we could be the guinea pig in you know, getting access to some of those profits and getting these people connected in Fiji. But connectivity is critically important for us. Thank you very much indeed. I'll come to Jeffrey last in this round, I think, because he can reflect on uh, the policy <laughs> actions he's heard. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, Paul Tai in, uh, in the Holy See. One policy action that uh, you'd like to see? Um, I think ultimately we're looking for connectivity in order to increase the possibility for communication and inclusion of people in a global platform of communications. I think the technical side 
is, as Jeffrey might say, relatively easy, even the economic side of that. What I'd be really interested in is that we educate people to ensure then that they become fully informed and responsible users of the technologies to which they are introduced. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Victoria Grand, uh, one policy action the private sector might like to see? Jonathan, encryption is very much under threat around the world. So the one privacy action I would like to see is to ensure a more open and secure internet by preserving the ability to operate encrypted platforms at scale. I also just want to acknowledge that there are real concerns about the size and power of tech companies. We understand that. Certainly more people are turning to online platforms to connect than ever before. And use of these platforms is surging to meet these fundamental needs. Let's not forget though, that these platforms are helping hundreds of thousands, if not millions of small and micro businesses all over the world quickly shift their business to online. Being online is not just a trend, but it's a matter of survival for so many of these businesses. And many of these tech platforms have enabled that ability to grow. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Victoria. Uh, Chat Garcia Ramila, your policy action that you'd like to see pursued. Well, what I want to see is support for community connectivity and resilience. That's what I want to see. We need complementary models for, co for connectivity. We cannot rely any longer on big telecommunications because they will not go to where there is no profit. And we do have models now of community connectivity. So we do need policy and regulatory environments that enable these complementary models. We need the, those unconnected to connect themselves because they do have that ability. We are a small organization, but we have supported and we have built capacity of over a hundred um, community networks with other partners. And there are models out there. And there are regulators that are interested in this. And this is a and this is what I'd like to ask Mr. Zhao. You know, you've said investment, innovation, and inclusiveness. All three of these are in the community um, networks model for local operators in based in the community. Okay. Hu Lin Zhao, you have 15 seconds to answer because time is tight. Want to answer that? As a matter of fact, I also very much highlight the SMEs here because uh, the telecom guys, they invest a lot, but uh, nobody can have any success in any business if uh, local SMEs will not support them. And then local SMEs has a lot of uh, fantastic uh, you know, uh, innovation uh, ideas and uh, they know the need of the local community, the new technology, so they can contribute a lot. So that we really have to count on them and of course, the telecom now yeah, inside our business, the telecom guys has a problem with the so-called OTG guys, SIP. They have an industry fight among themselves. For me, again, I, I agree with uh, uh, my friend that uh, you know, we have to create a good environment to encourage people to go to those people not connected where there's no profit. And we have to create a, such kind of environment to take uh, you know, this uh, investment into those areas to help people. Otherwise, you cannot uh, you know, get business done. So that is uh, clear. So better ICT for better life, then we have to come together for better ideas to get better ICTs. Thank you. Sounds as though that's where Jeffrey Sachs's billions come in, not his billions, of course, but the billions that uh, he was talking about. Uh, Pamela Cretu, uh, before we come to Jeffrey, Pamela Cretu, uh, what one policy action you'd like to see people take? Uh, thank you very, very much. Well, first of all, neither in Moldova nor in Austria have I seen the youth to be involved in the IGF discussions. Uh, and if I have, they are very limited. And being based in Vienna, I could do more work with the UN headquarters here to bring more youth voices into the regional IGF related discussions. I believe there is a need for a youth club on the future of online and remote learning and education. And that would bring together a group of, that, that would bring together youth from around the globe to discuss about the main challenges they face now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the solutions they see or the solutions they have tried within their communities. And once in a while, we would share the ideas with decision makers across important, or, important global organizations. 
and institutions such as the UN or the Global Partnership on Education and yeah, many others. Thank you. Pamela, thank you very much indeed. All right, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, you go last, but uh, you've made your policy suggestion in a way, which is about the, the use of the wealth of, uh, of, of some people. What is the chance, do you think, of governments really pursuing that? Look, I think uh, the uh, issue is access, and I would uh, recommend that within a year, every school and every clinic in the world should be connected. This is absolutely practical, and within uh, four years, everybody can be connected. It's a matter of switching on the switches, it's a matter of basic devices, uh, and it's a matter of basic financing. And uh, with the chat, I just want to say regulations can make companies do things. Uh, now, part of the problem is that telecoms provide the data, but the big money is earned by WeChat and by Facebook and by Amazon, and they have to step up. So there are four people in the United States uh, that have $540 billion of wealth including the owner of Victoria's company. Four people, 540 billion of wealth. This year, they have increased their wealth 204 billion. 204 billion for four people. I want Mark Zuckerberg to say, what is Facebook gonna do? What is his personal wealth gonna do for universal connectivity? Because it's a very good question and a very important question. And what stops us from getting every school and clinic online right now? We have hundreds of millions of kids who are not learning right now because they have no device, they have no access. And the amounts of money we're talking about is a tiny fraction of what these people have made in the last few months. And they were already gazillionaires. So we, we should not be suffering so much when there is so much capacity to solve the problem. But we have to understand where the capacity is. And it is in big tech and telecoms, which lives on this sector, makes a fortune on this sector. And as Victoria said, yes, small businesses all over the world come through your portal. Exactly. So let's get on with it and get the universal access accomplished which we need to do to save lives and to get kids back in school. And I know that Mark Zuckerberg's interested in kids in school. So let him come forward with the incredible fortune that has just occurred. And today the stock market's up another 1600 uh, last time I checked. So the fortunes are unbelievable. Let's come up with some practical answers to get every child online and every clinic online within the next year. Thanks. Okay, Jeffrey, Jonathan, thank you very much. And uh, Victoria, quickly. okay, 10 seconds, you can yeah. have your riposte. Yeah. Yeah. Just to speak to Mark Zuckerberg's um, investment, when Facebook acquired WhatsApp, we were able to do three things we hadn't been able to do before. First, we were able to invest in bringing WhatsApp to everyone around the world for free. It's easy to forget that calling and texting people used to be incredibly and often prohibitively expensive. WhatsApp used to charge people. Facebook made it free. Facebook also helped WhatsApp make WhatsApp private. So it wasn't encrypted until we joined Facebook and Mark supported this foundational project to bring that level of privacy to now 2 billion people. And finally, Facebook invested so that we could offer not just texting, which is how WhatsApp started, but voice and video calling worldwide. And these have been the things that have surged most in terms of uses during the pandemic. Victoria, thank you very much. Time is I, very, I, very tight. I, I like I, your I like your technologies. Uh, I think that they are a big solution for the world. Uh, and uh, I think that since uh, Mark has made an extra $32 billion this year uh, and is at $111 billion net worth, you can use your technologies and we can figure out how to get those few billion to Africa. It's not true that everyone has access to WeChat if you don't have if you don't have an account and you don't have a device, you don't have access. Uh, you do in principle, but I wouldn't keep saying that everybody has access to it. That's what we're talking about today. Not everyone has access to it. Some kids are not in school this year at all because they have no access at all. So please, with some responsibility, let's get them to school. It's possible. Right. Your technology is wonderful, no doubt. 
Jeffrey, thank you very much. Uh, order, order, as they say in the British Parliament. Uh, thank you very much, word. Indy. Um, let, uh, maybe some of these ideas, by the way, will be taken up by the G20, which could be an important vehicle for this. Italy has the pre uh, presidency of the G20 from January. Maybe they're watching this. Maybe this is uh, one for the G20 to move on uh, and many of the other ideas that we've heard. Right, we have just about five minutes left. I'd like to ask all of you, uh, what is your voluntary uh, commitment that you're all willing to make today to further this agenda? Uh, your personal commitment. I will start with uh, Hulin Zhao. Yeah, we, uh, we try our best to mobilize uh, everybody and uh, every possible resources uh, to, you know, to invest in ICT. You know that. Uh, uh, let me just give you uh, one small example. We're talking about connected schools. And actually, when 2003, 2005, which is finished, we set up the goal to connect all the schools by 2015. Now, today, 2020, we're still talking about connected schools. I can tell you, when I was in, in, in Tonga, close to Fiji, 2016, the two schools I visited, primary school graduated, deputy prime minister graduated, there's no internet connection. And then in, 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 in Lesotho, I visited two years ago, where they already started their 5G uh, pilot uh, in the capital, why uh, 100 kilometers away in the mountains, there's no connection at all of internet. So this is unfortunate. This is still the unfortunate reality. So that we have to, 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 to really to, to work uh, very hard. And of course, connectivity to these people is one, and then to increase our you know, capacity of quality of services to 5G and you know, Internet of Things, uh, current computing, that is another thing. And I too all, you know, want to, to work with our industries, with our society on these important challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas Yartzenbeck, uh, your commitment. At first, let me repeat one thing to Facebook and WhatsApp. So I believe that this is for free. It's not the solution that is the problem because nobody else is able to compete and to bring a better alternative to WhatsApp because of this. And you're not becoming that for free. You pay with all your data. And this is a high price, I have to say. So I can only renew what I said to antitrust. And uh, what have we done or what are we doing to, to, uh, to, to uh, to enable the IGF. So uh, in the last year, uh, we made a significant amount of money, 650,000 US dollars to help uh, traveling for representatives from all regions and all stakeholders all over the world, especially from the global south. And on day zero, Minister Altmaier underscored his strong commitment uh, to the multi-stakeholder approach by providing 1 million US dollars to support the work of the IGF secretariat over the following three years. And since then, we have continued our involvement in the field of internet governance, not least as a co-champion on the future architecture of the IGF. And this year, we have again provided logistical and substantive support towards the preparation of the parliamentary roundtable. And I believe it is good to enable more parliamentarians to be there, not only the governments. Thank you very much, Thomas Yatsunbeck. Uh, I Saeed Khayoum in uh, Fiji, do you have a voluntary uh, commitment you'd like to make? Look, I mean, I, uh, we, we've talked about it. I mean, uh, digital age has been hailed as a great equalizer, but I think it's the greatest disequalizer if you don't get any connections or people that get, get left behind. So for us, connectivity is critically important. It's very interesting, I was watching everybody I think I'm the only one from the Southern Hemisphere. So it's about 2.30 a.m. in the morning here. And, uh, but it, it also goes to demonstrate that there are many countries like ours that are very small. We're not big players. We don't attract the big boys and girls uh, into our economy. It's, it, as it is very hard to get companies into connect. We have one or two companies here. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, you have to be innovative. We've set up uh, various trust funds. So a certain percentage of uh, telecom companies uh, go towards setting up the trust funds. We set up community telecenters. Uh, we we now are trying to get infrastructure sharing between all the different telecom and uh, radio and television companies to be able to reduce the capital cost to get more focus on service delivery. So connectivity is very very critical for us in that in that regard. Thank you very much. You'll deserve your bed when you eventually uh, get to it in a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, Monsignor Paul Tai, a, a voluntary uh, commitment you'd like to make? I think one commitment straight off would be that the Vatican would try and encourage churches globally to use its educational resources 
promote better digital literacy. That people will be more critically aware of the environments in which they're working and will become more committed to using those technologies to achieve really good human communication. Good communication is ultimately a human rather than a technological achievement. And I think we just want to promote that where possible. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Uh, Chat Garcia Ramila, your uh, your human, uh, your your voluntary uh, commitment. Yes, we will continue to build capacities for community connectivity. That is where the growth will happen. That is where we will definitely make a difference in the divide. Um, and you know, and and we hope that the investment we can convince, and we will continue to knock on doors of regulators and policymakers so that they can in, they can be they can enact um, policies that help um, build this this um, capacity and this connectivity on the community level where there is no access. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Pamela Cretu, uh, is there something you would like to commit to? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, just to mention it again, uh, we do need more youth voices into the original IGF related discussions. So a global youth club would be just the perfect thing. And we need to ensure that communities come together to identify local solutions, such as uh, community libraries, for example. During the pandemic, there are just empty spaces that are not used. And for the children and students that do not have the, device at, the devices at home and with the right um, uh, disinfectation and um, opening the windows in the room, uh, they, they, can, they can use all of, the, all of the infrastructure that is already there and that is not used. So yes, that, that would be all, thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I noticed while you were speaking, someone uh, messaged big thumbs up for youth voices. So uh, clearly <laughs> it's getting some support there. Um, by the way, I know quite a few put questions on here. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them due to time, but don't worry, they will actually uh, be considered during the course of this IGF. Uh, Victoria Ground, do, uh, do you have a voluntary commitment without wanting to reopen the previous uh, rumbustious argument? Okay. Jonathan, we will continue to provide a reliable service for personal communication that works even in areas where there is low and limited bandwidth. We will fight to preserve our ability to operate on encrypted platforms to not allow anyone to listen in on your WhatsApp messages. And last, we will continue to stand up against the increasing trend of government hacking. Last year, we detected an attack from NSO group that turned your mobile phone into a surveillance device, tracking your movement, turning on your camera without you even knowing. We shut it down and we sued NSO and we will continue to root out and fight government attempts to use our platform to spy on critics, human rights advocates and journalists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeffrey Sachs. Leave no one behind. Let's uh, keep <laughs> committing to the sustainable development goals. It's, uh, it, it is the basic principle of decency in the world. So uh, I hope uh, that, that we accomplish what we've all uh, agreed needs to be done. That seems like a very good uh, phrase to end on. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you to all of our panel. Uh, thank you to all of you who've taken part uh, watching this event as well. Uh, I wish everybody a great IGF. I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Lots of fascinating panels. But thank you to everyone who was involved today. Uh, from my home here in lockdown London to your homes, your offices, wherever you may be, uh, have a good rest of the day and enjoy this great forum. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. That was great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sorry we didn't have more time. Thank you, yeah. Jonathan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It's a great panel. Thank you. 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 Thank you.